I would like uh, I would like to ask uh, uh, and to invite Professor uh, Neil uh, uh, Gandal, who is the uh, professor of economics and the head of uh, the Bergler School of Economics at uh, Tel Aviv University. Professor Gandal is a, a research fellow at the Center of Economic Policy Research. He was the managing editor of the International Journal of Industrial Organization from a. Uh, 19, uh, um, of 2005 to 2012. Please. So thanks, Yaniv, and, uh, and thanks for inviting me. Uh, it's actually a nice time in the conference to talk. I mean, people are hungry, but not too hungry yet, although some people did leave right now. So hopefully um, the next few talks will give you some sort of um, you know, something better than food. OK. Uh, in any case, um, I'm kind of unusual in the in the sense that, well, maybe for many things, but uh, I'm usually in the minority of things, but I'm, I'm an economist working on uh, working on cybersecurity, which is actually surprisingly rare, and, and, uh, and unfortunately probably too rare. Of course, I'm not speaking to many economists now, so, but my message when I go to conferences with economists is, you know, these, there's a lot of interesting issues, and we can probably contribute something here. So I'm going to try to convince you in the short amount of time I have that we can contribute uh, something to this. Um, I don't have to tell you most of the work in cybersecurity has been done by computer scientists and engineers, some legal scholars. Um, the economists were late to the game, but that's okay. We're late to the game on almost anything. You know, very interesting questions were first asked by sociologists about networks. We came late, but you know, better, you know, better late than never. Okay, and uh, there's a nice quote from Russ Anderson, which you know was a computer scientist, but you know I think was among the first to say, "Hey, wait a minute! You know, we really need the economists, and why do we need economists? You have to understand incentives. You have to understand, uh, as the previous speaker said, institutions. You have to understand, as a speaker two speakers ago said, you have to understand how standards work. And uh, so there's a growing interest in this area, and there, I think there's some really interesting joint work done now between. Uh, not just economists, but social scientists and uh, engineers slash um, computer scientists. Okay, and you know, s since um, some people who, who write in this who are not economists actually often build models, I thought I'd just say you know a word about how we we build models because in the, this paper that I'm going to present about two minutes of, we actually built a model to to analyze a trade-off. You know, and the trade-off I think was discussed a little bit earlier in one of the talks that, you know, the idea is that, you know, if vulnerabilities are not published, then, you know, maybe the vendors will be slow to fix them. But on the other hand, if they're published, you know, hackers, uh, bad hackers, whatever, um, bad guys can take advantage of it in, in, essentially, in essentially the same day. Um, so when I was learning about uh, cybersecurity, which also was just interesting how, well, that's a different story, but how did I ever get into this? Um, we first sat down with engineers and computer scientists, and before we did anything, we tried to build the simplest model possible to examine the trade-offs, because I think that's one thing that economics is good at. As I remember, we were talking with the engineers and computer scientists were getting so much information. In the end, after going back and forth with them five times, I mean, th then we came up with a model that only had like four things in it. And I think everyone was a little bit disappointed. I said, but, you know, if I, if I put all the 40 things in, you know, we won't be able to figure out what the, what the key trade-offs here um, are. And of course, you can always expand. But since there had been no model ever in this, in this area about, uh, you know, incentives for, you know, vendors to disclose or not disclose vulnerabilities, we thought it was, would be good to start with some, some basic things. And one thing when you do this is you have to decide which variables um, are kind of exogenous, so you can't influence them, and, and which, are, which are endogenous. And, uh, and then something very, very important in a lot of our models is uh, strategic interaction. It's something in, in my particular area of research, which is, uh, I, it's called industrial organization, but it's really like the economics of oligopoly models. Oligopoly means several firms that have market power and strategically interact with each other. And strategic interaction is a, is a key thing to include in these models because it often, you know, first of all, it's very realistic and it, and it uh, often leads to, you know, 
surprising outcomes. By the way, uh, John Mash, who just uh, passed away this, uh, this past week, who was a mathematician but did win a, very, did win a Nobel Prize in economics, was the first to help us model uh, strategic interaction. So we're, we're not talking about monopolies where there's no strategic interaction or perfect competition where there's lots of firms, but again, no strategic interaction. But most of the world, most uh, markets have Small firms, uh, strategic interaction. So anyway, when we, when, we, when we wrote down this model about, um, and then we wanted to see what regulators might do, what regulators should do, what regulators could do, when you want to introduce regulators into, into models like this, you have to ask, you know, what are reasonable instruments for them? Can regulators set price? No, probably not. In most cases, we're not going to see regulators setting price. Um, this would be like the price of the software because in some cases we show that maybe a different price would be better. Can regulators require consumers to install updates? Okay, as, as the first speaker said, <laughs> obviously, obviously not, um, especially, you know, especially many places in the world it's, it's not possible. Can the regulators uh, set disclosure policy? Okay, well, there are some institutions um, okay, in the market that under circum some circumstances manda mandate disclosure, those have to be included too. You have to take an account of them in your model as well. But, uh, but it's, it's a question as to whether regulators should, if you were going to allow them to set policy, would, you, would they be able to do anything better than what the market did? So, so the background for this, like I said, was uh, a large software firm was very interested in having research done on, on uh, network or cybersecurity, and we we began to learn about it. And the first thing they told us about was, you know, all these viruses that you know that had been very damaging. You know, it was true that um, they were damaging, but the patches actually were in play. And again, talking about what the first speaker said, that's the nice thing about being one of the later speakers, you have the benefit of other speakers going ahead of you. And the problem was that people who patched were actually okay. People, though, who didn't, you know, were, you know, were not, and, and their computers were exploited because the hackers were able to re reverse engineer. And we know now that it's basically a zero-day world. By the way, that was the reason I changed from being like sort of someone who never updated to someone who had automatic updates after I, after I spent that first day out in, uh, out in Seattle. Okay, so the, um, the, so the model that we are not going to talk about, I'm not going to talk about today, it's, it's just a very simple model, but it's a model of you know, a disclosure dilemma for, for firms. Should they disclose vulnerabilities and issue updates? Because that protects consumers who, who actually do update. It even increases the value of the product because it's safer. But on the other hand, as, you know, as was said earlier in the conference, not all consumers install updates. In, indeed, a large percentage of them don't. And then if hackers can get into it, and there always are some bad hackers, and reverse engineer, which they can, if a, which is the amazing thing. We know it probability one. If there's a, if there's a patch out there, um, someone is, uh, someone is going to take uh, advantage of it. So then you're making the software, um, you're lowering the content or the quality of the software for people who don't patch. So it's a very strange kind of thing because you, on one hand you're increasing it for some, you're decreasing it for others by, I guess I had my arms in reverse order, okay, but anyway, increasing for some, decreasing for others. It's kind of like a yoga move which I do in one of my classes when the students are bored. So if you guys bored, we'll have to do a little yoga. But. You don't, look, you don't look that bored. Okay, so anyway, um, we basically we basically build this model, um, and I won't I won't go through it. Um, for those of you who are interested, you can uh, you can go into my website. I'm gonna I'm gonna try to go through this very fast because I know that we're also a little bit behind in time, and we wanna we wanna get to lunch, and uh, so I'll try to go through this very fast. But but basically the basically it's, it's a very simple model. Firms have to decide whether they're going to disclose or, or not disclose vulnerabilities. It's their, in, first in the model, it's their decision. There's no, there's no regulation. Okay, and then we'll see what happens. We'll see what the market outcomes are. And uh, so what you have to do is you have to write down what the, what, you know, what the actions of firms are. So they basically have to decide whether they're going to disclose or not disclose. Then they have to choose a price for the, for the software. And consumers have to decide whether they're going to buy, or why not, not buy, but license, whether they're going to acquire a license for the software. And then they have to decide whether they're going to update, if updates are available. Sometimes updates might not be available, okay, if, uh, for example, the firm decided not to disclose the vulnerability. And there, there's a few other things we check into. Um, I won't spend any time going over the literature because there's, there's just not time for that. And 
then we can actually, once we have you know, gotten to an equilibrium, we can do something that's called in economics comparative statics, which means can you change something in, say, the institutions, or, or can you add an institution, or can change one of the ex variables, and how does that affect the outcome? Does it make it better? Does it make it worse? Okay, again, I don't have too much time to go into this stuff, but you can think about you know, these bug uh, bounty programs and these private markets. How do they affect things too? Again, once you have the basics, you can, you can expand. Okay, so again, the model, which I'm not even gonna put up one single equation, but uh, this is what the framework was. Whether or not to disclose vulnerabilities, the firm had to decide. And if it discloses, of course, it's gonna issue updates. I mean, that's, that's absolute. And then it had to charge a price for software. And consumers had these two choices, whether to license and whether to install updates. And we had some important parameters in the, but only a few of them. Okay, we had a probability that the firms will find the problem before the hackers. And then we had a probability of um, attack if there's no disclosure, okay? Because if there's no disclosure, you know, not everyone knows, you know, maybe only a few hackers know, and maybe they're, they're not such bad people, maybe they, they won't attack, okay? These were exogenous parameters. You could make them endogenous. Indeed, one of our big mistakes is at first we wanted to make that gamma endogenous. We wanted to make it a function of the number of adopters, okay? That delayed our paper by about a year and a half because it was impossible to solve the model and we wanted to solve it analytically because it's the first model, we wanted to see what was going on. So sometimes even if you're trying to make things simple, um, you, make it, you, you make it too complicated. So anyway, we left those to be exogenous and then we played around with them and showed what happens when, uh, when we change them. Um, and there's a couple other parameters too, but those are, those are the main parameters. And by the way, we said if, you know, if a firm discloses the vulnerability, then the probability of attack goes to one. And it's funny, when I went around to present this at, at economics departments, they would always say, ah, oh, but that's not, you know, that's not realistic. And I said, well, it may not be realistic, but it's true. Okay, so, I mean, they just, you know, I said, these, these, you know, this, is some, this is a fact, okay? So it's, you know, some economists don't like facts. In any case, uh, in any case, that was, I think that's a realistic thing to include in the model. Um, the, the bottom line is we can figure out what firms are gonna do in equilibrium, we can figure out what consumers are gonna do, and we can characterize everything. And then, if you're really lucky, you can sum up everything in one graph, okay? This is a graph that you, you don't really have to understand, okay? This was the probability of hacker attack when there is no disclosure on the left, so it could go from zero to one. And this was the ratio of damage to the cost of updating. This is a cost that consumers bear by having their computers reset or restarted or, or whatever. Okay, and, uh, and the bottom line is there's lots of things that go on, but uh, we know what, what the firm does in all of these regions, okay? Sometimes it discloses, sometimes it doesn't, you know, and it, of course it affects the price and everything. The bottom line is the market does pretty well. Only in region one would there be a conflict between a firm that was trying to maximize its profits and a regulator who was trying to maximize social, uh, social surplus. So before, I mean, the message of the model is just basically before we get in and, you know, Say, oh, good. Let's have a regulator come in and uh, you know and set mandatory disclosure policies. That would be something really bad, okay? Because right now the market gets the right outcome. That that region one is is kind of a sliver. It, it's kind of it's kind of to scale, and uh, so if you if you required mandatory disclosure, if you had a regulator required that, you would make things a lot worse, okay? Um, the and you and you can see why um, in region one mandatory disclosure would be good because that was the one case where the firm wasn't doing what the regulator would like. I mean, the firm wasn't disclosing the regulator would like to disclose. But in regions two, three, and five, you would, uh, okay, you would just uh, make things worse. And those regions are pretty big. So, I mean, the me one of the messages of this model is it's not always new rules, new regulations, or things that matter. Sometimes the market does, uh, does reasonably well. Yes? Let me ask the question. So you're assuming that the disclosures that are made are all honest, okay? Of the firms? Yeah. So as an example, I can use disclosures uh, actually both in cybersecurity and in general security to influence my Okay. So if I was to make some disclosures that are deceptive, I can actually increase costs on the attack. 
thought about that? Okay, that would be a very interesting addition to the model. And the nice thing is, once you have this framework, you can you can add something like. But you're right, the basic model we assumed all the disclosures were, were honest. Okay, but that, that's a nice way to extend it. And one of the things I learned when I come to conferences like that is that those are strategies that are really out there and uh, and worth thinking about. Okay. Um, you're going to probably give me the one minute sign. So I'm going to even do something rare in this conference. I'm going to skip what I have left because I know that uh, Sharon has some very interesting things to say. And uh, this way I will, I will finish early. Thank you very much.